Welcome to one and all. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all today to on behalf of the Dunhuang Foundation. I'm Julia Grimes, the Deputy Director. We'd like to express our deep gratitude for your continued support. It's my honor to introduce now today's speaker, Melody Dumi. Melody Dumi holds a BA in Art History, Anthropology, and Archaeology, and an MA in Museum Studies from Ecole du Louvre in Paris, as well as a degree in Chinese Studies from Analco in Paris, and an MPhil in International Relations from Cambridge University. Prior to joining the British Library in 2015 to work as curator and researcher for the International Dunhuang Project, or IDP, she was assistant curator at the Victoria and Albert Museum and worked in the UK and overseas in a range of cultural institutions. In February 2018, she became a permanent member of the East Asian section at the British Library as curator of the Chinese collections with a particular focus on the Stein Collection, the subject of today's talk, and the International Dunhuang Project. Her interests include the material cultures of China and the Eastern Silk Road, Buddhism, the history of collections, and cultural diplomacy. Melody's topic this afternoon will be the Stein Collection in the British Library. Without further ado, please join me now in welcoming her. Thank you for inviting me for, for, to talk today and for being so flexible in, um, in changing the time of the presentation. Um, so today I'll be, I'll be talking about the manuscripts from Dunhuang in the British Library Stein Collection. And I wanted to start with um, one of the, the questions that I'm most frequently asked um, in my role, which is, how did you get this job? And, and in all fairness, I, I, I completely understand where people come from when they ask me because um, the British Library holds one of the, the most outstanding collections of manuscripts and printed books from China and Central Asia. And so for this talk, I will focus on, on, on the items that were acquired by uh, Sir Mark Orlstein during his visits to Dunhuang. And these attest to the, the richness of the links between China and her Central Asian neighbors in the first millennium of the Common Era. And I hope that you'll enjoy the stories that um, they have to tell. So first of all, I wanted to share with you the, the, the presentation outline. So I will start by talking a bit about the history of the collection um, so that you understand how um, these items uh, came to be at the British Library. Um, then I will give you an illustrated tour of the collection. So I had to be uh, quite drastic in my selection because obviously we, we only have one hour. Um, so this is only a portion of the, the, the items that we have at the British Library. And I've structured that particular section in three different subparts. So first of all, I want to talk about materials, book forms and techniques. Um, then I want to mention the fact that it's a very multilingual collection. Um, and finally, I want to talk a bit about the nature of the documents. Um, because as most of you may know, it's um, a collection that's mainly Buddhist in nature or relates to Buddhism, uh, but there are also um, some documents that relate to other religions and are of a more secular nature. So I will mention that in that section. And finally, I just want to, to briefly um, mention some of the activities that we're conducting uh, at the British Library. And um, so first of all, um, some little introduction to the history of the collection. Um, so let's start with uh, Mark Orlstein. So he was um, born in Budapest in 1862 um, and was later a uh, naturalized uh, British citizen. So he graduated in Sanskrit and Persian and received his PhD from Tübingen in Germany in 1883. And the year after that, he actually went to England um, to study Oriental languages and archeology span before setting out for a career in India. So he's, um, Stein is also known, uh, he's known as a linguist, but also as a surveyor, ethnographer, geographer, and uh, first and foremost, as an archeologist and explorer, as he led uh, four successive expeditions to the far Western regions um, of China, where he excavated sites in the present day um, provinces of Xinjiang, Gansu, and Inner Mongolia. Um, so he first visited Dunhuang, um, Oh, here you've got um, a photograph, which is actually with, is at the British Library, um, and it was taken uh, in 1901. So during Stein's first expedition, um, in the, and that's taken in the Tarim Basin, showing him with his travel companions, including uh, his uh, 
Nice, I have canine, a companion, dash the dog. So um, here, so he first visited Junhuang um, and the nearby Buddhist Mogao cave complex in 1907. So that was during um, his Central Asia, his second Central Asian expedition, um, which took place between 1906 and 1908. And then he visited Junhuang again uh, in 19. 14, so during his third expedition. And that photograph uh, was taken in 1907. So it, it also shows um, the caves as they were when he was at Dunhuang. Um, and yes. So when um, soon after his arrival, um, Stein was informed of the existence of a small chapel or recess um, that had been discovered seven years uh, before, so in 1900, by a Taoist monk uh, called Wang Yuanlu. And so Wang Yuanlu was, had a, basically um, pointed himself the local caretaker of the caves and was conducting some restoration works where he stumbled upon um, a crack um, in the corridor leading to a larger cave. Um, and so upon further investigation, uh, that revealed the entrance to a, a smaller recess that was packed from floor to ceilings with manuscripts, um, paintings and other artifacts. So here you've got um, a photograph that is from uh, Stein's publication. It's actually recreated, it's quite often used, but the original photograph that showed uh, bundles arranged right outside. Um, so here to the right, uh, where my pointer is, you can see the entrance to the library cave. And here there, and there you've got in pink um, the little the repository as it stands in relation to the much larger cave. So carved um, in the rock right uh, front on the north wall uh, of the corridor. And so that uh, photograph Stein recreated uh, by superimposing two photographs to actually show the, the, the bundles um, in, the, in that corridor as the original no one had been um, so exposed. So, um, also to give you an idea, we've got here um, a photograph that was taken in 1908, so on the left, um, by Charles Nouet, who accompanied uh, the Frenchman Paul Pelliot during his visit uh, to Dunhuang. And that is actually Paul Pelliot in Q17 surveying the, the manuscripts. So you can see here the, how they're piled up uh, in the little cave. Um, and obviously some of them had already been purchased by Stein then, but you can that really gives you an idea of what um, the, the, the room uh, would have looked like. And here to the right, you've got also um, a black and white photograph of um, that um, was taken uh, by Stein in 1907. And that's got the caption, but with the caption bundles of manuscript rolls from the Wardup Temple Library. And when you look at it, you really get an idea of how the manuscripts were bundled up together and really compacted. You can see how they're, they're tightly um, um, kept together, which also explains um, their, their, their condition, the condition that they, they arrived. And so um, after lengthy uh, negotiations with Wang Yuanlu um, and also again small monetary, a very small monetary payment, uh, Stein uh, managed to procure uh, 24 cases of manuscripts um, and five cases of silk paintings, textiles and other artifacts. And those were shipped um, to London, where they were studied, catalogued, um, photographed and published. Stein had control over the, the, the sorting and listing of the collections um, before they were then proportionally um, distributed between the government of India, which had covered um, roughly 60% of the second expedition's uh, total expenses, and the British Museum, um, which sponsored the, the remaining 40%. So collection were then um, roughly allocated on the and uh, divided on the basis of type, style and language. So um, with regards to wall paintings, embroideries, graphic works and 3D artifacts, um, they, they, they were then spread uh, between the national, what is now the National Museum in New Delhi and the British Museum's uh, Department of Oriental Antiquities. And if you want to find out more about that, I would actually recommend you to watch um, the, the, the lecture that was given recently by uh, Dr. Yubing Luck of the, the British Museum, where she explains a little bit about this, she talks about it. So um, 
for textual materials, um, we then the ones in, in Chinese, um, Fokjian, Old Turkic and Uyghur were deposited at the British Museum's uh, Department of Oriental Printing Manuscripts, whereas the rest, um, which were mainly documented in Sanskrit, Hotanese and Tibetan, were given to the India Office Library. And so this, um, Yes, so um, the, uh, what is now in the British Library's collection and what, how did these items end up with us? So the British Library was established in 1973 and, and the, uh, at that point in time, uh, the British Museum then parted with the textual materials which were deposited at the British Library and kept the pictorial materials. So. Um, Obviously, that division is not so clear cut. We'll see that there are some exceptions, but that is roughly how it was decided. And in 1982, uh, manuscripts which had originally been deposited at the India Office Library were transferred to the British Library. So the um, yeah the press marks that um, have been uh, given to to those shelf marks that are given to our collection items actually reflect their in institutional history. And I wanted to, to highlight that here, especially if you're trying to look for them online. So the, the items that were at the, the British Museum have been given the prefix OR, which stands for Oriental Prints and Manuscripts Department. And they're followed by a serial number, which um, reflects some basic classification according to languages and archaeological sites. So um, in the case of the Zhonghua manuscripts, we've got two main sequences. So we've got OR.8210, uh, which is made mostly assigned to um, text in Chinese language. And then within that sequence, you've got those that have the, the um, radical S that stands for scroll, and then are numbered from one to over 13,000, so 13,677. And then the OR A210 slash P series, which are the printed documents, and we've got 20 of them. So they go from one to 20. And finally, the other sequence, which is OR A212, actually contains a small, much smaller number of manuscripts from Dunhuang. Um, and these are quite often they bear multiple texts, uh, multiple languages, multiple texts, um, and um, written in Chinese, Tibetan, Sanskrit, but also Old Turkic and, and Sogdian. And so um, the, the press marks of the documents that were deposited at the India Office Library actually combine um, the prefix IOL um, and then the first letters of the language. So IOL tip for Tibetan, um, IOL tip J uh, more specifically for um, items from Dunhuang, and then IOL hot for Cotonese and IOL san for Sanskrit. Right, so now that we've um, looked at the history of the collection um, I want to give you um, an illustrated tour of the collection um, so um, first of all um, I would like to talk a bit about the materials uh, book formats and techniques because I think that the ones that are represented in in the manuscripts from the library cave actually provide um, a wealth of information about the the production the circulation and the use of manuscripts as objects and so um, I wanted to start with uh, the format that is most commonly found in our uh, collection, which, is, which are scrolls. Um, this example is actually quite a rare occurrence, I, I should say, because it is being preserved almost intact, uh, but it's also a good example of, um, of a scroll. So scrolls are um, long horizontal um, strips of paper uh, which are so they're made of um, different sheets of paper glued together, and then they're rolled or wrapped around a wooden a wooden roller or core, which is slightly longer, and sometimes also has some little um, knobs to facilitate uh, handling and rolling. Um, and you can see that in the case of this one, which was also the they they, they have a protective flap at the front. Uh, with a, a seal, like a little wooden stave here, this um, and and then a silk braid or silk tie, so that they could be um, tied and securely um, when stored. Or also here, you, for instance, you also oh, where's my the 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 name of the yes the name of the the text here that appears and then. You can see how, especially for that um, example, which is um, written on very fine mulberry paper, um, you can see how the, 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 the scribe has laid uh, very neat margins and guidelines and within which the, the lines of the Chinese text um, 
are written. So, um, yes, paper could be um, sized and dyed, and uh, as is the case in this manuscript, but also in a lot of manuscripts found in Cave 17, uh, they were dyed with um, a yellow um, dye called um, Huangbo, or it, which was obtained from the bark of the Amur cork tree. And um, it had some, uh, the, it was used for its properties as a, an insect, but also a water repellent. Um, so now that we've seen that how uh, scrolls were, and also I forgot to mention that scrolls were then um, unfurled one segment at a time, but also following the, the reading direction of um, the Chinese, of Chinese. So that is from um, right to left and um, um, yes, top to bottom. So here are, for instance, I thought I could not really um, give an overview of the collection without mentioning our printed copy of the Diamond Sutra. Um, it was also its anniversary two days ago. So I felt the, we, was a good opportunity to, to then um, talk about it um, with the John Huang Foundation audience today. Um, so you can see at the bottom a stitched image of the scroll uh, in its entirety. So starting with an illustrated frontispiece followed by the text of the sutra and other incantations and then uh, complete with its um, end panel, uh, which is beveled there and also attached to the wooden roller. Um, so it may be missing its original uh, protective flap at the front, but otherwise it's traveled through time almost intact, which is uh, pretty exceptional. Um, and so um, the scroll itself was produced um, using, so we saw the previous one was handwritten, and this one was produced using woodblock printing on paper. So um, to create a woodblock, um, the text or illustration um, was first produced in ink on, a, on paper and then um, pasted face down on a wood block. And once that was done, an engraver uh, chis would, would chisel away um, the blank parts so that only the, the, the black lines or characters or outline of the, the illustration would then appear in relief as a mirror image. And so what that, once that was done, the block was inked and then paper was applied to the surface to take an impression. And so the, the, the sheet of paper was then peeled off, put aside, and the process could be repeated as many times as necessary. And so that scroll measures about uh, five meter long. And it was uh, printed using several different um, wood blocks, one for each, um, each sheet of which um, the, the scroll is comprised. So um, but yes, I wanted to, to talk now, uh, focus a bit more on that, um, on the beautiful, um, beautifully illustrated frontispiece of the Diamond Sutra. So the Diamond Sutra um, is uh, based on a sermon that was given by the historical Buddha. Uh, so the text begins with the phrase, "Thus I've heard um, as sutras typically do, and then it describes um, how having begged for food, um, the, the the Buddha ate and settled down to answer um, the questions of his elderly disciple Subhuti. So the, 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 the scroll opens up with this uh, very preaching, pre preaching um, image. So the scene is set in a, a grove of trees. Um, there is a small cartouche actually, I forgot to, here in that corner that actually um, gives the name of the Jetavana Park in, in Shravasti, in modern day Uttar Pradesh in India. And um, so identifying exactly where the, the sermon took place. And so at the center of the, the composition, you can also see um, the Buddha there sat on the lotus throne, uh, wearing a monastic robe um, and also with um, halo and mandala in his back um, and then flanked by um, nine monks, so four on, the, on, on his right, um, five on his left, all of them with shaved heads, but you can actually see that they're rendered with um, almost um, individual facial features, some of them older than others, for instance. Um, to the right there, you've got two bodhisattvas, and he's also flanked by uh, some wrathful deities, um, one here and one here, and then I've cropped the image too much, but you can, there are also two lions. You can also see them reclining lions who are also um, part of that assembly. And the, the Buddha and his assembly are actually 
all under a, a bejewel canopy uh, under which you can see um, some celestial beings known as Apsaras or Feitian in Luhong that are come with long uh, trailing clouds. And here um, also these figures have been identified as potentially as an emperor and empress. So that assembly, I forgot to mention, rather than um, being depicted in frontal view, um, is actually in, and facing the reader. So when you look at the, the, the scroll, is actually um, depicted in a more dynamic three quarter profile. So they're looking towards the, the elderly figure that's located on the, the lower left corner. And that figure is actually identified as the disciple Subulti, to whom the sermon of the, the Diamond Sutra is directed. So you can see how he's neatly placed his um, black shoes on next to his prayer mat and having, having put a knee on the ground and bared his um, right shoulder as per the text of the sutra is holding his hands together uh, in supplication, looking towards the Buddha for um, answer to his questions. And so the, the very layout of the frontispiece of the illustration on the frontispiece actually establishes visually the, the nature of the scripture as a dialogue between uh, the master and his disciple. And it also quite naturally leads the, the, the gaze of the reader to, towards the content of the conversation that then unfolds in the following section of the scroll. So yeah, the, the, the finesse and also the amount of details uh, that in that il illustration itself that just evidences the fact that printing was had already grown into um, a very a mature technology by the ninth century in China. And it has been suggested by scholars that the diamond sutra, this copy of the Diamond Sutra could have been produced in Sichuan um, rather than Zhuhuang, where Sichuan was then a, a thriving printing center. And so now I wanted to move to the other end of the scroll, which is um, where to, to focus a bit on its colophon, because it's this very colophon that actually um, gives us the, the, the very date at which um, it was commissioned. So it says on the 15th day of of the fourth months of the ninth year of the Xiantong reign period, Wang Jie had this made for universal distribution on behalf of his two parents. And so that short dedication um, note gives us a lot of information about the context surrounding the commissioning of this copy. So we know that a certain Wang Jie sponsored the, the project. So on the 11th of May, 68, um, according to the Western calendar, in order to, to disseminate the Diamond Sutra um, very widely, so for universal distribution, and to earn merit for his parents. So whether they were um, alive or dead at the time, that we don't know. So as demonstrated that by, so there were um, over 500 manuscripts um, that were removed from cave 17 by Stein. And that really shows that the, the Diamond Sutra must have been a, a very popular text in Zhuhuang. And it's hardly su surprising because the, the scripture itself um, calls for its own reproduction and distribution as a way to generate merit. So by, by turning to printing, uh, Wang Jie would have accumulated uh, merit or good karma on a scale um, and at a speed that were previously unimaginable. And in addition to this, um, printing would have meant, would have ensured greater accuracy um, during the replication process. Um, so now I'd like to move on to um, this item, which is the Sutra of uh, sutra of the Perfection of Wisdom in 100 and 1000 Lines. And um, it's possibly, yeah, so it's, um, the text is actually in Sanskrit and was copied um, by hand on, on palm leaves, which is a material readily available for, for writing in India. And um, like these folios would have been stacked up and held horizontally in front of the reader and, and then bound together with, um, with a thread going through um, the string hole, the central string hole here. Actually, other poetries sometimes have two string holes. Um, so the, this book format, as I, I just said, um, is referred to as a poti, and is um, probably the format through which um, many of the early Buddhist texts were actually transmitted eastwards um, along the Silk Road. So the, the manuscript 
original now with there are 69 um folio extant with text on both sides uh, but the, the the original manuscript would, would have possessed over 1000 folios um because it's the longest of all the the sutras um of perfection perfection of wisdom um so this particular one manuscript is actually thought it's believed to have been uh, created in uh, in northern india so around the 8th century uh, possibly even earlier so sometime in the 7th century and then um, to have traveled um all the way to northwest china so all the way to gansu perhaps going through tibet um during the period of Tibetan occupation of Dunhuang, so that's 780 to 848. And so here I wanted to show you that some examples of Poti pages, so also found in uh, Cave 17, but made of paper. So Poti pages made from paper um, all seem to have originated from Central Asia, but then they were obviously adapted to um, for writing both Buddhist and non-Buddhist texts, but in other languages. Um, so at the top here, you've got um, a page from a Tibetan a tantric ritual manual. Here on the right, um, it's a Chinese Buddhist commentary, and that's the second second folio. The first one um, has been lost. And here at the bottom, you've got a Hotanese copy of the Diamond Sutra, and they're all dated roughly to the 9th to 10th century. And this one, uh, Yes, is also beautifully illustrated with a golden uh, Buddha figure and then also some uh, floral patterns in gold and alternating in gold and red uh, here. So, um, yes, so now moving on to uh, another item, which is um, a concertina um, of the Lankavatara Sutra with commentary. So, um, it's a, a that book form is a later development, which um, in, is a hybrid form uh, derived from uh, both the scroll, because it's made of rectangular sheets of paper glued together, but then they're folded um, in a way that uh, makes them resemble poti leaves, so with the, the rectangular shape of poti leaves. So contrary to, to what you may think uh, when looking at it, the commentary is actually um, the section of text in Chinese, so written in black ink, um, and the scripture itself, which is the Tibetan translation, is um, in red ink. So um, the format actually accommodates um, both the both writing directions of uh, of Tibet of Chinese, when you you read it as a scroll going from uh, right to left, but also um, as um, also of Tibetan. So for instance, here if you flip the manuscript. 90 degrees to the left <laughs> you can see that you can uh, you can see how you can read tibetan there going from left to right um and so it is likely that this manuscript was used as a translation a possibly uh, in the workshop of uh, wufa chang or Gojap, um and so that led to the, the the translation which is in the tibetan canon of the in tibetan of the lankavatara sutra so the Concertina, um, oh, so I forgot to mention this particular one also have string holes, although they're probably just decorative because because the pages are folded, it's very unlikely that they, they, they didn't need to be bound together by a string. Uh, but that in a way is very evocative of um, the poti, poti format. Uh, so the concertina um, probably emerged from the 9th century onwards, and then um, it's often considered to be a precursor to uh, another form of book, uh, which is found at Dunhuang, which are booklets or kudaises. Kudais. So uh, it's um, that's one of the latest uh, stages of, of book forms and that are found in Dunhuang manuscript. And here I've picked uh, one of my favorite items, which is um, a very small illustrated uh, booklet of the, the, the Avalokiteshvara Sutra or Guanyin Sutra. Uh, it's about 10 centimeter tall and each of the pages roughly eight centimeter wide. Um, so it's one of the, um, of the thousands of copies of the Lotus Sutra that were um, found at Dunhuang, uh, so in Cave 17. So at the, the British Library only, we have about 1,000 copies of the Lotus Sutra uh, in the Stang collection. 
um, from Dunhuang. So the, the scripture is actually um, one of the most influential in Mahayana Buddhism, and it appears um, to, have be, to have been extremely popular at Dunhuang. Um, and this particular manuscript actually contains chapter 25, uh, which describes um, how any being in, in trouble could call upon um, Avalokiteshvara, who's the Oguanyin, who's the, the Buddha of uh, compassion for help. And so increasingly um, that text, the, the, that chapter became um, singled out as a standalone text um, called the Avalokiteshvara Sutra. So it details um, how um, the deity basically assumes 33 different forms to rescue people facing various situations, so going from fire, drowning, shipwreck, or imprisonment. So um, it is also illustrated with um, colorful scenes uh, that are laid, and you can see how they're distributed here. In the, the, the top section of the each page, you've got the illustration, and then at the bottom, uh, the text arranged in uh, vertical lines. Um, and they are roughly coinciding, but not exactly. So I've cho chosen this opening because you can really see um, the, the, how that works as a visual narrative as well. And that complements the written content um, that is below. So, so the reading direction is again right, right to left. And so here you can see a couple um, on a prayer mat who are um, basically asking uh, Guan Yin for offspring. Sorry, I keep pushing on the and um, and you can see here on the right that their wish has been fulfilled as the lady is giving birth to a healthy baby. They're popping uh, at the bottom from underneath her robes. Um, so the um, the small size and the, the, the so the format of the booklet probably made it. Um, portable and easy to consult, but uh, it's also thought that um, the thick paper and the relatively uh, rough handwriting may also indicate that this item was intended for personal use. So, um, so now I want to move to my next subsection, which is um, the fact that it's a very multilingual collection. So Dunhuang was an important hub on the Silk Road and home to peoples from various ethnic, um, various ethnic backgrounds. And um, the, the manuscripts from uh, Cape 17 were written in over 12 languages. So Chinese and Tibetan are the most frequent. So I think it might already be obvious from my selection. Uh, but they're followed by smaller groups, you know, in Khojani, Sogdian, or Turkic, and Sanskrit texts. So um, this diversity um, is also a testimony to the cosmopolitan uh, nature of the region. And I wanted to start here uh, with the old Tibetan annals, uh, which are uh, dated roughly to the 9th century, and they form uh, Tibet's earliest extant historical document in Tibetan, because prior to that, only sources uh, in Chinese were known. Um, so it's primarily, I should say actually that the first, this, the, this manuscript has been split in two parts, and the other half is now in the Pelio collection in the BNF, so Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Um, so it's primarily, this is known as the civil Annal, and it's um, primarily a bureaucratic register of events. So it covers almost a hundred years uh, from the middle of the seventh century to the middle of the eighth century with obviously some gaps, um, but it gives a, a dated almost year by year prissy of important events. And so the years are given here um, on the left, you can see in red. Um, so the, yeah, that, that it, 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 it's basically they're, they're considered um, and they provide a, a priceless view of Tibet in its early phase of um, expansion and establishment as a powerful empire, starting with events um, during the reign of Songtsen Gampo, who's the first Tibetan emperor. Oh, and I forgot to mention, uh, which is also quite a frequent occurrence, that that text was written at the back of um, Lotus Sutra in Chinese. Or um, so here we've got, um, so among the, 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 the items that stand up from Dunhuang, uh, there is a, a much smaller number of documents in Sogdian, which were not deciphered at the time. Um, it's about, we've got about 60 manuscripts at the British Library. And um, so Sogdian was a middle Iranian uh, language spoken by um, 
in the Central Asian in the Central Asian region of Sogdiana, which um, now corresponds to the, the present day Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. Um, so from the 4th to the 10th centuries, um, the Sogdians played a major role as international traders along the Silk Road. And that led to the establishments of Sogdian communities at various staging posts, including Dunhuang. Hence the, the presence of um, those manuscripts. So this one actually contains an episode uh, from the story of Rustam, who's one of the heroes um, from the Persian national epic, the Shanama or Book of Kings, which were, yeah. So it is one of the few um, purely literary text surviving in Sokjan. And that also reflects a common Iranian heritage. So the episode, so again, this um, manuscript is actually uh, split in two parts. My colleague Ursula Sims Williams wrote a blog post about it. The other half, so the first part is actually um, at the BNF, it's Pelio Sogdian 13, so 13, uh, if you want to look for it. And the episode described here is actually, is one that doesn't occur in the Shahnama. So the, the story tells about how Rastam, having defeated the demons, decided to rest. Um, he ate a meal and then went to sleep. But that's the precise moment that the, the demons decided to, to counterattack, to take advantage of, of the fact that he was asleep. But Rastam's horse um, then wakes him up and the two of them basically gang up, plot together how to conquer the demons and defeat them again. Um, so here we've got um, a scroll which contains um, six Buddhist incantations known as Dharanis, as well as sutras in Sanskrit and Hotanese. So it's a very, very long scroll. It's 21 meter long. So I think when forded is roughly, I don't think you can see, but it's, um, you can really see how extremely large it is. Um, so hot, it's written, Hotanese um, was a Middle Iranian language used from, approximately 200 uh, before the common era till about the, the, the end of the first millennium by people who were living on the, so in the kingdom of Hotan, which is on the southern edge of the Tarim Basin, so west of Dunhuang. So during the, the 10th century, the kingdom of, of Hotan had very strong diplomatic relationship with um, the local rulers of Dunhuang and that in turn fostered economic and cultural interactions. And Cave 17 is the second, the single largest um, source of Hotanese manuscripts. And most of them um, actually date from the 10th century. So this uh, scroll was copied um, within a period of uh, six months um, of a, in the year of the hair. So according to scholars that would um, correspond to the year to 943. Um, and it was the, the, it was commissioned by a Buddhist patron who requested in return long life for himself and for his family. So the um, yes, it, it, the, the the language is so they they they're basically transcribed in Brahmi script, um, but they both Sanskrit and Hotanese are both read from uh, left to right to, to bottom, which means that which hence the the vertical format of the scroll. And so here I wanted to share with you also that um, beautiful. Um, silk wrapper or silk cover, which is also part of that manuscript. Um, and it represents uh, some confronted painted geese standing on, on lotus flowers and holding some branches in their beaks. And so um, the, 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 the fact that the, you know, the size of the item plus the, the, the beautiful painted silk cover actually um, indicate that the patron himself must have been quite important or wealthy. And that also shows the presence of a well-established um, Hotunese community in the region of Dunhuang in the 10th century. Um, so now um, to finish uh, that subsection, I wanted to talk about um, the Ugbitik or Book of Predictions. So it's um, a Turkic omen text um, that so Kirk Turkic is is actually here written in in runic script, which was invented by the the Turks specifically um, for works in their own language, so all Turkic, and possibly as a reaction um, against the more usual Uyghur script, which was derived from Sogdian. So it is the longest and most extant manuscript text in all Turkic script. So that that little booklet actually contains uh, fifty five folios. 
Um, so the, the, the main text um, comprises, includes uh, 65 question, uh, sections and each represent a particular divination. So you can see here, like the, um, here you have three groups of between one and, and four circles. It's also the case here on that page um, that are filled in, in red. And these are actually the omen, so Irk in all Turkic. And they're the subject of the divination. So then it's followed by an explanation of the omen and then a judgment, so whether it's good or bad. Um, the text is not precisely dated. I think scholars are not in perfect agreement about it, uh, but um, there is a colophon at the end um, in, the, in, the, in the last two pages that um, indicates that it was written on the 15th day of the second month of the year of the Chaiga. Um, at a Manichaean manuscript. So yes, it could be, have been any time during the 9th or 10th century, which is also when uh, the book, booklet as a book form developed. And so finally, I wanted to talk about the character of the manuscript. So I think we've seen that the, the majority of the, the Cave 17's documents um, are either Buddhist scriptures or have an association with Buddhism which confirms the dominance of, of Buddhism in Dunhuang during the first millennium of the common era. But there are also a considerable um, number of other religious um, and secular texts. And so um, the, the, the so-called secular texts, for instance, uh, range from economic, legal and official documents to works on, on, works on art, folk songs, uh, poems and dance and due to the the scarcity of the the material surviving uh, from the period in China they are almost the only primary sources available and so among the topics um, of the, the fields that are covered for instance there is um, astronomy and I wanted to sh share with you the the Dunhuang star atlas which is possibly dated um, to the middle of the 7th century so it really is, uh, you can see here at the bottom, um, again, a stitched image of the, the, the whole scroll, which starts here. So here at the beginning, this the brown paper is actually um, conservation. It's a repair to prevent further damage uh, in handling. Um, and here you've got in the first part, what is a divination uh, text based on cloud formations. And you've got uh, 26, I think, um, figures. Um, and then it's followed by, by the star chart, star atlas itself, which is about two meter long. So just to give you an idea, it's about the length of a double bed. Um, and so that it's really a testament to the depth of, of the depths of Chinese astrom astronomical knowledge. Um, because the, the scroll covers the Chinese sky in its entirety, um, and it is the oldest and most complete um, known star atlas in the world and the first pictorial representation of the classical Chinese constellations. So it is divided in, into um, 12, zones, 12 um, zones centered on the equator. So you can see here, and they're accompanied with explanatory text. And it ends with um, a circular chart of the North Pole and a figure representing the God of Thunder. So named as Tian Shen. So, um, 13,045 stars in total are shown on that star chart. Uh, all but three, I think, uh, have been um, identified and they're grouped in asterisms, um, which are similar to, to constellations, but far greater in number. So they would be different to, to constellations as we know them. So here, for instance, I wanted to share a detail of um, map five uh, for the fourth lunar month. So it's next to a reconstruction of the Chinese sky uh, for the year 652 that was uh, plotted using a Mercator projection by two French scientists from the CNRS. Um, so the, the Mercator projection was not invented until the 16th century. So it is really astonishing um, that the map could be could have achieved such precision and accuracy um, at a time. So that's hundreds, especially because it must have been drawn with the naked eye because that was it was drawn hundreds of years before the invention of the telescope. And so here, uh, for instance, you you can see all the the stars and 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 
you might be able to identify it as the constellation of Orion as we know it, even though for, for the Chinese, it actually, these stars were, so it's known as a completely different asterism. These stars were associated with the warrior Chan and um, with as, at his feet, so the, um, the well of uh, Jade constellation, so Yutin, um, and then he's armed with his banner and um, yes, um, protected by the army of Prince who come on their um, on, on their on their on five chariots. So astronomy was um, was very much an imperial preserve and emperors directly employed um, astronomers to to chart the heavens and record phenomena for two main reasons. So the first one was to um, record time accurately. And the second one was to make predictions. So Chinese emperors thought, sought um, celestial clues uh, for political and, and, mili and military decisions. So a map this sophisticated actually would, it's quite unlikely that it would have been uh, for private use um, because the ability of the sky of, you know, to look up um, to the skies and interpret the signs uh, was so highly prized that it would have been a protected state document. So why it ended up in, in Dunhuang is still a, a bit of a mystery. And so to finish uh, on that section, I wanted to, to, to talk about um, the chart of Moxibustion method. So this one is roughly dated to the seventh to 10th century. Um, so moxibustion is um, a traditional um, treatment that is similar to acupuncture, which more of you may be familiar with, but instead of needles, um, it consists of burning moxa, which are dried herbs, that you then apply to treat illnesses by warming up and, and invigorating certain points on the body. So the manuscripts here um, shows different human figures with descriptions that include the name and the location of the points, and then the prescription of moxa and telling you what the treatment is. Um, so yeah, that was just to give you an idea of the, the, the range of uh, the documents found in Cave 17. And so to finish and also come back on that point that I made earlier, that, that, that the division between pictorial and uh, textual material was not always so clear cut. I wanted to, to show you some items that I selected from the collection. So on the left, you've got a Buddha stencil that is thought to have been used um, probably to replicate the image of the Buddha on the slopes of the Mogao cave ceilings. Um, in the middle, it's a Tibetan tantric ritual implement representing the tantric deity Vajrasattva with the five Buddha crown. And then on the right, you've got a paper cut flower and that's dated to the 5th to 10th century. And so finally, I'd like to move on to my last uh, section, which is about some of the activities that we have um, going on at the British Library. Um, so um, the International Dunhuang Project, or IDP, so it was established at the BI in, the 19, in 1994, um, and it's an international network of institutions wanting to, to make information and images of the manuscripts, paintings, textiles, and artifacts from Dunhuang and other archaeological sites um, on the Eastern Silk Road, freely available on the int internet. And among the missions of the IDP are the, the conservation, digitization, and cataloging of all those items. And also the idea to facilitate research, education, and outreach. So um, the online platform is available in different languages. Here I'm sharing with you uh, the English uh, platform, which is you can access if you type www.idp.bl.uk. It's hosted by the British Library. And um, so you can access, it's basically a unified repository where you can find um, artifacts from Dunhuang and other sites, uh, but hosted in different institutions around the world. So um, on the right, I've um, shared with you, for instance, a search result for um, so Sadharma Pundarika Sutra, which is a Lotus Sutra copy in Chinese, also from Dunhuang, as you can see here with the site. Um, yes, so um, within the umbrella of the IDP at the British Library, we're currently uh, conducting a multi-year project which is called the Lotus Sutra Manuscripts Conservation and Digitization Project. It's externally funded by um, the Beishan Tang Foundation and 
with the aim of conserving, digitizing, and making available online um, almost 800 scrolls. So it's what, 793 in total, I think. And so you can access, you can have more if, if you want to find out more. Um, there is a project page on the British Library website. I've put the link here. Um, this scroll there to the right is mainly for illustrative purposes because I don't think it falls within the scope of um, our project. Um, so with the project team is led by project manager Tan Wang Ward and we've got three conservators. Here you've got a photograph, a photo of Maria Mozart who's working on one of our collection items. And then to the right, we've got John Nichols who's one of the senior imaging technicians working on digitization of um, the manuscripts in the photo studio together with Isabel uh, Reynolds' log. Uh, so yeah, I, I think um, I wanted by choosing that picture of one of our scrolls before conservation to, to really show you the condition that um, the items are in because when you see those beautifully, this beautiful digitized content, it is easy to forget that they're not all, <laughs> they're not, in pristine condition and that there is a lot of work going on behind the scenes to actually uh, make the collections available. So the, the, our conservators really work their, their magic on, on the scrolls um, by preserving them also for future generations to come and, and our photographers also make an amazing job on capturing them in such detail that if you actually um, choose to look at the high resolution images you can really see that the paper fibers and all the, the you know the water stains the oil stains everything that is part of the the, the manuscripts history. Um, so here is a before and after picture of one of the scrolls that has been conserved within a project uh, and yes, uh, before I finish, I also wanted to mention um, our um, IDP North American Silk Road uh, Collections Project, uh, which is jointly supervised by um, the IDP at the British Library and Georgetown University. It's managed by Miki Morita, who I think will be um, speaking uh, very soon in June, um, and also uh, supported, generously supported by the Dunhuang Foundation. So I think that's it for from me, uh, but I'm happy to take questions and I've included some uh, useful links. So a Stein collection guide on the British Library website, the IDP website, but also links to the Asian African Studies collection, um, so blog on the British Library and the IDP blog. All right, Melody, thank you so much. That was an amazing lecture. It gave us such a good overview of the collection and also the activities that the British Library has been pursuing to conserve and to just you know, get the word out, publicize um, all of these treasures that are found in within the collections. So we have a number of questions, as you might <laughs> imagine. So we'll start right off with the first. Um, on the concertina, the Lankavatara Sutra, was the Tibetan written first since it was the main text and the long Chinese commentary written later? Yeah, actually, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure how it, because it looks more like, a, whoops, hold on. I'm trying to revert back to my slides to see if I, don't know if we have any Tibetologists in the. We might have a few. If my colleague Sam Van Skyke is in the <laughs> listening, he might want or may not wish to chip in, but he knows that manuscript's much better than I do for having studied it. Um, yeah, Sam, if you have an answer, please let us know. If you type it into the question box, I'll be able to read it out to everybody. Sam is here, by the way. So <laughs> put him right on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, because it looks more the Tibetan is almost like an interlinear comment and, and so to help form, formulate the, the translation. But I will leave um, Sam to come up with the, yeah, okay, the more accurate we'll answer. <laughs> yeah, we'll anticipate his answer. <laughs> All right. Um, our second question is, can these wonderful items be seen by any visitor to the British Library or special access needed? So there, because of obviously of their age and, and, and condition, they are restricted items. We do issue them in the reading rooms to researchers who have very specific, you know, research questions, because as our aim is to, to really limit the, 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 the 
the amount of handling, because that's most of the damage goes through those scrolls is mainly through mechanical damage. So we, we ask first and foremost to, to refer to digital surrogates, but these can be issued uh, for research, um, you know, if needed. And we also really try to, to, to lend them to institutions who are putting together um, you know, exhibitions. So, for instance, I think maybe this one traveled to the Getty. Um, it did. <laughs> uh, yes, as well as uh, several of the items I chose today. And so we've also had, um, so the star chart uh, was in the, the our Harry Potter exhibition um, and the Diamond Sutra was also on display uh, in the writing exhibition that took place at the British Library. And um, the, the, it's currently on display in our treasures gallery. So we, we, we do try to make them as accessible as we can in our galleries and through loans. That's excellent. Thank you, Melody. We have um, an answer from Sam. Thank you, Sam. He wrote the Chinese text includes the text of the sutra and the Tibetan is written in, in between interlinearly. So yes, the Chinese text comes first. All right, so Sam, thank you. Hmm? All right, our next question. Were there any Pali texts? Were there any, sorry? Pali texts found at Dunhuang. Pali text. Um, that's a good question as well. Not that I know of, but um, I'm not an expert on those languages, so um, I can take the question with me and ask some uh, <laughs> colleagues whether they, they 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 know, or if maybe anyone in your audience actually knows about that. If anyone knows, please let us know. We've seen the Sanskrit text, but if you know if there are any Pali texts, please do mm. write in and let us know. <laughs> All right. Um, so another, it was an interesting question. Why were such different treasured manuscripts deposited at Dunhuang? Were they gifts or tributes to monks? Oh, um, that we're not sure about. <laughs> no one really knows. And that's uh, partly because we don't know why um, the manuscripts were deposited in cave 17 and why the cave was sealed. Um, but I think from, a number of the colophons you can uh, you you know you can uh, see that the the scrolls were were commissioned by people who were trying to generate merit um often for people people who were sick or diseased people to facilitate their afterlife or even uh, bring some uh, benefits to the future generations um and I think a number of those items also seem to have belonged to individuals so there are several manuscript that can be linked to to the Hmong Daozhan, for instance, uh, but also some that possibly were linked to the Hmong Hongbian, who the, the, the chapel seems to have been a, a funerary shrine to. But uh, short answer being, it's a, a mixture and uh, no one really has a firm answer for that, I'm afraid. It's a million dollar question. The question we always get, but so difficult to answer because there's no answer. <laughs> As of yet. We do have an answer, though, to the Polly question. So Sam oh. wrote in again. Thank you, Sam, and wrote no Polly. So there's yeah. no Polly. Okay. No Polly text. <laughs> right. Um, oh, are there plans to digitize the British Library's version of Su Hui's fourth century poem, Xuan Ji Tu? That's a very specific question. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have the manuscript number with me. Um, there are plans to digitize the whole collection. I think at the moment we have about 10,000 manuscripts that still need to be digitized. And the reason they are not digitized is often that they are um, in very bad condition so that they would require hours of conservation before they can even be digitized. So um, yes, we are working behind the scenes to make this happen, but it is taking time. And uh, we are aware that there are some very rare texts, some of them unique, that right. we would like to, to be able to share with people more widely. And we will do that uh, as soon as it is possible. That's excellent. Oh, by the way, Matt has already written in Matt Kimberly and said, I've scoured for poly texts in the collection and there are none. Okay, the I thought that was the case, but uh, I'm glad that Sam and him can uh, confirm that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. It's good um, having some friendly faces in your <laughs> It really is. You can crowdsource a little bit. Um, so are all the items in your presentation accessible online? 
So all the items yes, that have been shipped. I've, I've, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've picked some items that have been digitized. So those ones you can, if you use the, the shelf mark I put at the end of the, the little uh, information or label caption about them, and you type it in the search bar on the IDP, then you, you should be able to access the high resolution images. Excellent. Thank you, Robert. Downloadable. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, we had a question about um, just the classification and nomenclature. Um, first of all, thank you so much for such an interesting lecture. You said that S in the call mark of uh, the Stein collection stands for scroll. Um, I've heard there are scholars who think that might stand for Stein in the same way that P in the BNF collection represents Pelio. Um, why do you think that S represents scroll but not Stein? Thank you. Uh, yes, the, the good question. Um, so why do I think so? It's mainly because then we have P, which is numbered from one to twenty and stands for print. And yeah. so uh, most of the, the the manuscripts when they arrive were in the scroll form. So, and I think it makes more sense. Otherwise, both printed and scroll documents would be could have the S for Stein. Uh, but I will be on the lookout for, we also have some of Stein's archives here in the UK, so I'll be on the lookout for some possibly evidence from him uh, as to, or if from maybe from the, 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 the arch institutional archives to see why there'd be use of S, but I think, yes, it's more like, it's more likely that is something used by, by scholars, but possibly wrongly so. Okay. All right, thank you. So a question from Scarlett in Heidelberg. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I'd like to ask you about where uh, the place where the Diamond Sutra manuscript you mentioned was produced. How do we know it was made in Sichuan rather than Dunhuang? Is there an inscription on it that suggests that? So no, there is no inscription. Uh, we know that some of the printed documents found in, in Cave 17 were produced locally. Uh, we've got also a small fragment, I think, that says it comes from Sichuan, uh, and also some manuscript that say, oh, this was uh, copied based on the, the printed edition of that text, printed in Sichuan. So Sichuan is uh, in the documents referred to as a very important and reliable center for printing. And the fact that the quality of the Diamond Sutra is really equal to none has made right. scholars suggest that it was printed in such one, but there are indeed no, nothing confirming that. So it is a theory. I think a very solid hypothesis, but no, no um, conclusive no. proof. No. Thank you, Melody. Um, we have a question from Stephen Tizer. Wonderful question. Thank you. Um, your estimate of the time frame over the next 10 years for finishing the digitization of the Dunhuang manuscripts in the Stein collection and posting them on the IDP website. No pressure. <laughs> so my estimate of time frame over the next 10 years. Right. Uh, <laughs> I wish I could have such a thing. I think we tried to do work in um, so for instance, the Lotus Sutra project, which is also working quite a large scale with 800 documents is a very key for us because um, it will help us establish perhaps, um, so we're, we're looking at the scrolls, for instance, in, in, number, in terms of their lengths and meters, so we, and try to correlate that with the, the numbers of hours spent on conservation, but there is so much in predictability because um, our conservators would be able to tell you that much more eloquently than I will, but when you, you're faced with the, each individual manuscript, they react differently to treatment and they have to really act on a case by case basis. And sometimes that's something that might look in absolutely dreadful state will take, well, still over 25 hours, but something that might not look so bad will then have a terrible reaction and, and they can end up spending hundreds of hours on it. So, and that is where it's a bit difficult for us to uh, ascertain exactly how long we need. I think we need a lot of human resources uh, <laughs> to, to conserve uh, those documents. And then obviously the, the digitization, you, you need very skilled people, which we are lucky to have at the moment, but this is no, you know, small task and the requirements are quite different for that type of material especially if you want to give very good um, you want to give access to very good images um, online so yeah it, it, then uh, there's the issue of funding which uh, every public institution is faced with so exactly particularly now it, but yeah 
it is not necessarily as straightforward as uh, we would like it to be. Right. It's very meticulous, painstaking work. You know, yeah, no, it's absolutely magical what uh, happens behind the scenes. It is. Thank you. Um, we have a question. Uh, Jing Feng from Cambridge University. First of all, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I'd like to ask, before doing any conservation, does the British Library keep a record of the original state of the manuscript? And is there any record or archive um, detailing the conservation work done in the past? Thank you. <laughs> That's a, a very good question, Ting. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Um, so our conservators now really document uh, quite thoroughly uh, the, the, the treatments that they're, they're doing. They also take a lot of photographs and we, we consign all of that uh, in our in the database. Uh, sadly, in the past, that was not necessarily done in quite a systematic way. And because of the history uh, the, the, of the collections, the fact that they were transferred from um, the India Office Library or the British Museum to the British Library and had undergone some conservation prior to that, uh, it is sometimes a little bit difficult to, to know in details what sort of treatment happened. Uh, there are some archives and it is one of the, the uh, project that some of our conservators would like to work more on. So it is to, to, to sort of um, unravel a little bit the, the history of the conservation, because it is essential to understanding the, the items, especially, um, yeah, trying to understand them now. Um, so again, work in progress, Ding. <laughs> oh, Ding says thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we have a great question from Avo Somio. What happened to Oral Stein after his discoveries and their transport to the uh, British Museum originally? Where is he buried? Um, that's a very good question, where he's buried, actually. I think we have something on the IDP website that tells you exactly where he's uh, <laughs> told me he's located. So he died in his fourth expedition. Uh, yeah. and. I'm, I'm again, I'm going to ask Matt Sam or anyone who might know that better. Is he buried in Afghanistan? No. He um, is. He's buried in Kabul. Is, yeah. Ah, thank you, Julia. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I haven't visited, but I've been fairly nearby. No, neither have Yeah, so he, he passed away there, and I guess that's where they just decided to bury him at the time. And so I see the question for the, the priority for early texts like Su Hui's by... Yes, I could, that's a continuation of the, uh, the other question about Su Hui's yeah. text. So is there a priority for uh, early texts such as that for women? Yeah, all, all of it is treated as a priority, really. <laughs> so, <laughs> because it's no non-priority. <laughs> Not really when it, no, <laughs> we, 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 because when you come, you know, it comes to a collection of such historical and cultural significance, obviously we, we want to, to really put, do what we can, but yeah, sometimes a little bit. And so where the illustrated booklets of small size? Like right, so, so were they of, of small size? So they designed that way so that they were likely portable and for carrying around a yeah, bit like so a book of hours. Yeah, so I think that's if you, you read like Imre Galambos or, or this French colored um, page, that's um, what they, 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 they say. And I think uh, we can see in the, 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 man, the, the booklets from our collections, a few of them have been folded. So you can imagine how they were carried on people, possibly like talismans. Um, and they, they actually show a lot of, of where, you know, you have some oil stains. You can see that they've been handled a lot. So there is definitely that you imagine that they were portable and that format did make that possible. We have a comment. Um, this is referring back to Oral Stein. There is a book called Foreign Devils on the Silk Road by Peter Hopkirk, which details this entire period of collecting these items. So that kind yeah. of, it tells you the history of that yeah, uh, time I think period. Just, Justin Jacobs actually um, also writes about them. The, the whole so he's also um if you want to read sources on the, the history of collections then he's a good reference um we have a question about are there any hebrew or syriac scrolls in the british library we had a lecture uh, in march about uh, hebrew and syriac scrolls at dunhuang so we have one uh, hebrew manuscript um so it's not um from dunhuang it's from uh, dandan oilik and it's a commercial text and it, yeah 
and there's one in uh, the Pelio collection, I think, from Dunhuang. Yeah, there is. And it, possibly uh, one in National Library of China. So I know of three, but. Um, this is an interesting question. Is there anything comparable in the British Museum comparable to the Dunhuang collection? Um, so the British Museum have got, they basically are, well, they're, they're, they're with the National um, um, Museum in New Delhi, they, 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 and the VNA will have some textiles. They are, they, they, they also have some items from the, the, the Stein collection, but they have mainly, um, they have some manuscripts. Um, and because the, the, the way the collection was divided, these are manuscripts with illustrations on them so that, you know, they have the pictorial element and they then have the, the paintings. So as I said, the Yuping, like my, my colleague at the British Museum gave a presentation for the Dunfang Foundation where she details all of that. So I would uh, recommend you to, to watch it. Uh, people would like to see it. All of our lectures are posted to YouTube, to the Junhuang Foundation's uh, YouTube channel. So you can search for it. And if you're subscribed to our listserv, we'll actually send you the links as they become available. So stay tuned, stay posted. Um, we have a question uh, asking if any of these items have ever been loaned back to Dunhuang or China and asking if the British Library works closely with the Dunhuang Academy in China as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we haven't had, um, we haven't loaned items uh, to China or Zhuhuang, but we do work very closely with the Zhuhuang Academy. Mm -hmm. So as part of the, the, the IDP, they're one of the, the partners and they also host a, a Chinese version of the website. Um, so that we have also a, a lot of exchanges with them and regular, so whether it's, you know, exchanges on, among scholars or like, but it's, they're definitely one of the institutions we are very regularly in conversation with and, and that for obvious reasons. So, because I don't think you can oh, really well, consider the, the collections without looking at the, the, the context and the place they came from. Exactly. So it is a very beneficial dialogue, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Melody. We have a, a, a lovely thank you here. Thanking you for the presentation and also for your care <laughs> and stewardship you. of the objects and of this work. So, yeah. Well, thank you right. so much to your audience participants who chipped in. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matt and Sam. <laughs> Matt and Sam, thank you so much. I'd like to mention both Matt and Sam will be speaking in our lecture series over the next two months. So, and I'll actually be announcing a little bit about that now. Um, so, first of all, I'd like to thank Melody for joining us today and for illuminating the provenance and some unique aspects of the Stein collection at the British Library. We, I, was, I find it so intriguing to learn about just how varied the types of manuscripts in the collection are, you know, from star charts to mock Sebastian manuals to sutras to more historical documents or epics. Um, just thank you for just showing us this broad panoply of items that you can find in this particular collection. We really can't thank you enough, Melody. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for um, having me. Oh, always. Uh, as a note, our, as I met, just mentioned, our next lecture in the Religions of the Silk Road series will be in two weeks. Um, it will be on May 27th and again at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, our, seat, our speaker will be, will be Sam, it will be uh, Sam Van Skyk, who's the head of the Endangered Archives program at the British Library. He'll be speaking on Sino-Tibetan astrology and divination at Dunhuang. So again, that's Thursday, May 27th, two weeks from today at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, further information is forthcoming. So to our viewers, sincere thanks for joining us today. We greatly appreciate you and your encouragement and your support tuning in every single time and your, with your excellent questions and comments. Uh, once more, I'd like to thank Melody and, and like to wish you all a lovely afternoon. Until next time.